making some TikToks about American Girl. And every time I refer to the original girlies as being discontinued, I get comments that no, 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 this isn't the case. Addie isn't retired. Samantha isn't discontinued. They're still there. You can buy them. Don't worry. And as I research American Girl online, I see that same sentiment all the time, that you shouldn't say AG used to make historical dolls. The historical line is still alive and well. They're adding new girls all the time, and you can still buy most of your old favorites. And I'm sorry to be the one to tell you this. You've been had. You've been hoodwinked and bamboozled by Big Barbie. This is a full-blown conspiracy, and we're gonna get to the bottom of it. Because no, the American girls of the 90s are not alive and well and living in Paris. They are dead. Or worse, undead. All right, for the uninitiated, what are American girls? American girls... Uh, well, some would say that they are dolls, and then those dolls have an extended universe of media. For people like me, who as kids engage with American Girl primarily through the books, I think of American Girls as story characters that have an extended universe that includes dolls, as well as movies and music and costumes and a bunch of other stuff. Arguably, American Girls are first and foremost catalog stars who sometimes manifest in the real world as real items if you are lucky enough to have been born into a particular tax bracket. Looking at the totality of the American Girl thing. I would say American Girls are themselves works of historical fiction. They're not in fiction, they are the fiction. They are fictitious yet fully realized beings, which girls, real life human girls in the real world, can have a vivid, tangible relationship with through her written stories, physical doll and many doll items, and extended world of movies, music, crafts, parties, and imaginative play. She is a discreet being who occupies her own complete world, and she exists as part of the pantheon of the American girls who experience different upbringings at different points in history. If you were an American Girl kid, and the language that I'm using in this video will sometimes be gendered because American Girl is marketed specifically towards girls and it is concerned with girlhood as an idea more than just childhood, but of course not everybody who was an American Girl kid was a girl and plenty who weren't girls like read the books and played with the dolls, so just something to be aware of. If you were an American Girl kid and you have memories from the 90s or 2000s of poring over these catalogs and soaking in the pictures of all of these different historical girls and their wardrobes of eight or ten outfits with different shoes and hats and the gorgeous furniture and their school supplies and the bits and bobs for their old-timey hobbies and just the lovely detail on all of their outfits and accessories. If you have those vivid fond memories, it is probably very comforting to hear that those toys are still around for kids today. But they aren't. They just aren't. That's over. That experience is not available to kids today, and not just because nobody uses paper mail order catalogs anymore. I mean, you can still get a paper catalog, but they have a website where most of their business is done. But even if you're on the website, you can't come close to that experience. Even if you're shopping in person at one of the brick and mortar American Girl stores that has everything they have, you can't have that experience of browsing a ton of different historical girls, all from different eras with historically accurate bedroom sets and trunks full of different outfits and holiday essentials and food and each with her own book series and an extended world of activities for girls, that thing doesn't exist today. But it seems that many people, including the fine people running the American Girl Company, don't want to admit that. And instead of being able to honestly refer to these girls as being discontinued or as being archived, which is a nicer way of putting it, they are stringing them along in a cursed half-life where they get paraded around as a shell of their former selves in an empty pretense that this national institution has not been completely gutted. I know that part of the problem here is just semantics. Like, it's very confusing to figure out whether a particular doll counts as discontinued because AG will not let the dead die in peace and they keep getting discontinued and then brought back and then canceled. So to clear things up, let's take a look at the timeline. In the early 80s, icon and visionary of our time, Pleasant Roland, yes, her first name is Pleasant, Legend Goes was inspired by a trip to Colonial Williamsburg to develop a way for kids to engage with history through reproduction and imagination. At this time, on the market, there were a lot of baby dolls and a lot of teen slash young adult fashion dolls, but not a lot that was in between. Pleasant says she had a hard time finding dolls for girls 7 to 10 that reflected the age of the girls playing. So she started developing her doll line with the idea that instead of playing at caretaking for a baby or imagining and looking up to the glamorous life of an older woman, a girl could imagine a girl like her. 
but in different circumstances. The relatability of seeing a girl like her would actually be a door into understanding a different world of the past. Pleasant collaborated with Valerie Tripp to develop the girls that would become the first American girls, which launched in 1986. In September of 1986, Pleasant Company, yes, the name of the company is Pleasant Company, launches the American Girls line with three original characters, each a nine-year-old girl at a different point in American history. We have Kirsten Larson in a Swedish immigrant community in Minnesota in 1854, Samantha Parkington in New York High Society in 1914, and Molly McIntyre on the Illinois home front of World War II in 1944. For each girl, there was an adorable 18-inch doll, a small selection of clothes and accessories and even some furniture, and three books about her childhood adventures in her particular era. The doll collections matched the stories, so when a book would describe everyday objects that she was using or there would be an illustration that would show what the girl was wearing at that point, those same items could be bought for the doll. The stories themselves are unique to the girl, but they follow the same pattern, and they use the same naming convention that reflects the six major canon events that each girl must experience if she is to embrace her true destiny as an American girl. The girls all have the same bangs, and they all follow a red, white, and blue color scheme for most of their items, although the tones are very different depending on the setting. At launch, the dolls and collections were strictly mail order items that could be purchased from the extensive paper catalog. Throughout the next few years, the collections were expanded to include three more books for each girl, with, of course, coordinating doll items. Pleasant Company also started releasing items that were meant for the girls themselves, like outfits to match their dolls, craft kits, cookbooks, sewing patterns, paper dolls, play kits, and probably a lot more. Once our three OGs got settled, Pleasant Company started adding some more girls to the lineup throughout the 90s. All of these girls were in development in some form from the very beginning, but they were finished at different points and they were released one at a time, usually a couple of years apart. In 1991, we got Felicity Merriman, our colonial girl from 1774, who lives in, wouldn't you know it, Williamsburg, Virginia. In 1993, Addie Walker comes on board as the first non-white girl in the collection. Her story starts in 1964 in North Carolina, where she is enslaved on a plantation. And then after she and her mother escape in the first book, the rest of the series takes place in Philadelphia. In 1997, we get Josefina Montoya. She lives in 1824 outside of Santa Fe in present-day New Mexico, but an area that was at the time under Mexican rule. The dolls are a hit, and of course they are. They're amazing. And throughout the 90s, Pleasant Company grows, and it's a good time. The company starts an American Girl magazine. The first brick-and-mortar location opens, American Girl Place in Chicago. They set up a website so you can get the dolls online. The girls get short stories and more outfits and increasingly extravagant extravagant furniture options. And then, in 1998, the same year that the last of Josefina's books were released, everything changed. Pleasant Roland sells the company and the six girls to Mattel, who you probably know as being run by Will Ferrell. So actually, in 1998, nothing changed. This is usually the case when a consumer products company gets bought out, the transition takes a while, and the new owners will kind of let things coast and let business as usual carry on while they get things settled. So for the next few years, it's mostly business as usual, and Pleasant Company goes ahead and releases the girls that were in development before the buyout. In the year 2000, we get Depression-era Kit Kitteridge, and then in in 2002, we get Kaya Otonmai, who is billed as the first American girl, hailing from the Nez Perce in the Pacific Northwest in 1764. So all eight of these girls were mostly or entirely made by the original Pleasant Company, and the six girls are what I refer to as the original six American girls. This is kind of logical because they are the six that were released under Pleasant Company before the buyout, uh, and I know I'm not the only one who refers to them this way, but that designation for me is also kind of arbitrary and just based on my age relative to the age of the dolls. When I was a kid poring over AG catalogs, Kit and Kaya were available, but they were new, and then the six original ones had just always been there. By 2004, the transition to Mattel is basically complete, and the brand changes its name to just American Girl to match the name of the historical brand. The 90s and 2000s are definitely the heyday of American Girl, which again is something I say with a tremendous amount of bias, because I really liked this stuff as a kid, so of course I'm gonna think it was best when I was 
a kid. But objectively, I don't think anybody out there is going to disagree that American Girl hit a peak in like the mid 2000s and it has not been the same since but they don't want you to know that. So things are chugging along. Throughout the 2000s, American Girl tries some new things. They make TV movies for a few of the historical girls. Featuring Mia Farrow and introducing Anna Sophia Robb as Samantha. And introducing Shailene Woodley as Felicity. I prayed so hard we'd see each other again someday. <laughs> Academy Award nominee Abigail Breslin is Kit Kittredge. For a girl who's just gotta dance. Molly, an American Girl on the Homefront, premieres next on Disney Channel. And along with the movies, they released Best Friends dolls. The Best Friends line was kind of its own line and kind of an extension of each individual girl to like add the best friend onto her collection and also kind of special movie tie-in merch. The friend was a character from the original books that would have been featured prominently in the movie and she got her own doll and her own outfits and accessories and sometimes special things like pets. So that sounds like a lot of stuff. Sounds like a lot of content, sounds like a lot of new toys to buy. It seems like things are really going great and they're putting a lot of effort and resources into these really popular first eight historical girlies. Felicity's collection has kind of been going in and out of the catalogs for a little while. And then in 2008, it is announced that Samantha, like Queen Bee Samantha Parkington, and her whole collection are going to be archived. This is only four years after they added a ton of new stuff to her collection with her movie and with her best friend Nellie, so it's it's kind of weird. Starting in 2009, Samantha's doll and collection were no longer available for purchase, although you still could get her mini doll and her books from American Girl. Kirsten got the same treatment soon after, and then Felicity was archived in 2011, and Molly was archived in 2014. Even for the girls that weren't completely archived, like Addie and Kit, their collection had started to disappear bit by bit. By 2014, the original six collections, as they existed a decade prior, just can't be purchased anymore. Addie and Josefina were still hanging in there, but only as a doll, sometimes with one or two extra items, not a whole world and a complete collection like they were when they were launched. And that was kind of the whole point. Pleasant Roland was famously inspired by a trip to Colonial Williamsburg, which uses a living history and reenactment model. That was what she wanted to explore with the American girls, a way for kids to engage with the past through tactile engagement with material history, through imaginative play, through written and mimetic storytelling. By this point, American Girl had stopped producing products like the paper dolls, the craft kits, the cookbooks, these lower cost products that gave kids additional avenues to have hands-on experiences with these characters and their cultural context. Hearing about one of these original six girls being retired was painful for anybody who loved the brand growing up, but Gen X seemed to take it especially personally, and the announcement in 2013 that Molly was going to be retired seemed to be the last straw. Reading the tree rings of past internet discourse, you can see around 2013 and 14 a very clear disturbance in the force when this happened. There are a lot of op-eds hand-wringing about it, and it's, it's very old journalism Twitter because they all cite and reference each other, so it makes an interconnecting web of self-fulfilling controversy. Most of this discourse frames the historical girls as having been displaced by contemporary girls. The argument is that Mattel bought out the brand and shifted its focus to contemporary dolls like the Girl of the Year and their selection of Just Like Me dolls that could be matched in appearance to the owner, which were more profitable and more aligned with the company's other fashion toy lines. And like, that's real. That was happening. It's, it's hard to argue that the company was focusing primarily on the contemporary doll products. The historical girls used to be the forefront of the brand. In fact, it was a while before they were even called historical characters at all. Originally, they were the American girls. But contemporary dolls were always part of the brand. They had been around since the Pleasant Company days. American Girl of Today dolls launched in 1995, and the first Girl of the Year was created for 2001, which was before even Kaya. The brand as a whole was growing, and I don't think there wasn't potentially room for everybody. A lot of these articles are very thoughtful and interesting. But a lot of them really begin and end with thing bad because different. And they are all very dismissive of the contemporary girls for their dumb names and their low stakes stories. This one is talking about some books American Girl had made that were kind of a choose your own adventure thing where you could pick different endings and slot yourself into a story. Readers can imagine themselves as the main character, a girl who loves swimming at the pool 
but is terrified of the lake. Remember when Addie escaped from actual slavery? Look, it's funny, I laughed, and it's not wrong. The girls of the year and the other modern day stories tend to be very bland and hyper local and totally allergic to real conflict. On some level, I do agree with this criticism and the underlying observation of the way that the brand has shifted, but this is basically calling first world problems right? That's what this is. And that's not a useful or empathetic way to think about the kids in your society. A girl's physical and material safety doesn't mean her fears and desires and experiences are stupid, and it's not her job to make them sound impressive for you, grown-ass adult. And this exact same objection could be leveled at many of the stories of those original historical girls. I assure you, everything that your beloved Molly cares about is trite when contrasted with Addie escaping actual slavery. For a girl who's just gotta dance. This is both objectively true and a very gross way to talk about a story rooted in actual real-life historical atrocity. When I read so many of these articles, I'm not seeing writers expressing love for these older stories, but using those older stories as just like a stick to beat the kids today with. And doing that requires making these classic girls into something they're not. Like, I agree that American Girl was radical in many respects, and in just as many ways it was outdated even when it was created. It was deeply conservative and in many ways retrograde. And still wonderful. And still fresh and fun and freeing and empathy inspiring and educational. She contains multitudes. But Pleasant Roland did not win history making. She did not conquer history making in 1986. We can keep doing more and doing better. The point is these girls aren't inherently better than any other character you could come up with. Samantha isn't better than Julie Alderman Bright or Sage or whoever because she's Samantha and she's clearly intrinsically superior. It was in the execution. It was in the how. That's what made her great. The value was in the complete and vivid world American Girl created around her. And that's why I think she still has a lot of value even though she is I'm sorry, deeply outdated. She was outdated when she was made, and she's outdated now. But her world invited curiosity and, and bore complexity and contradiction so she could be more than just outdated. And if Samantha ever stopped inviting those things, if she was ever stripped from her complete and vivid world and decontextualized as a purely aesthetic object, just an antique looking thing to put on a shelf, there would be nothing radical left. Don't worry, kids, don't stress. American Girl has a plan. In 2014, the historical girls were rebranded as B Forever, which is a name that I hate and also have to acknowledge is kind of genius. And great news, everybody, Samantha's back. Who? Who is this? Who is this girl? Because th this is not Samantha Parkington. I don't know, maybe Samantha's actress returned to the show, but now she's playing her original character's long-lost twin, which is great if you stand that particular actress, but is not the same as the character returning. And hey, Kid is here, and she's got a brand new dress. Huh. And Felicity's coming back too. Felicity, my favorite. I can't wait to see my girl. Yes, 911, I would like to report whatever this is, Be Forever seems to be pretty universally hated. And there are a lot of important reasons for that, like a lot of fundamental ways that the brand shifted at this point, but I'm pretty sure the most important thing is that these outfits are so goddamn ugly. This doesn't really matter to my thesis here, right? This is not the most important thing, except actually maybe it is. These clothes are ugly. The outfits are also significantly less historically accurate than the originals. They are less detailed and less well made, and a lot of them fit the dolls really weirdly. They also don't fit the characters as well in terms of personality and their particular circumstance, which actually are usually things a designer will give up in exchange for making a design that's more attractive to the modern consumer, but instead they made them this. So what was the point? I'll link to a good video by a doll collector who breaks down some of the ways that these outfits don't fit the silhouettes or the color palettes of the period, but instead are geared towards things that the contemporary viewer is going to think is pretty and girlish. It's a good analysis that covers a lot of important things, but in my opinion, does not give nearly enough attention to the fact that they are ugly. If you look at the lineup overall, after Be Forever starts, it's brighter, there are more jewel tones and shiny materials, and the girls are more more visually distinct from one another. They each have a more dominant, like, single signature color, which actually really reminds me of something else. 
that was happening at about the same time. In addition to taking the meat outfits and making them terrible, the Be Forever rebrand was also a big step in the overall shift of the brand away from these girls as discrete fictional characters that had stories and backgrounds and complete worlds. And the branding of the girls changed from their classic illustrations or the silhouette icons that were you know, iconic. They started using photorealistic images or sometimes just actual photos to represent the girls and show them in art and on the book covers. The classic books are full of these beautiful internal illustrations that are so memorable and a huge part of what makes those books so special, and for a while they were just completely removed. The six books for each girl were re-released as two condensed volumes. The looking back sections that used to be at the back of every book that offered actual historical context and more discussion of the event scene in the books, those were cut back to about two pages each. AJ never brought back those extended universe items that provided low-cost activities and different ways to engage with the historical era, although they did add games and activities to the website, and they sold a computer game called American Girl Premiere for a little while. And all through this time, we are still getting new girls. After Kaya, there was a gap of about five years while things switched over to Mattel, and then they started releasing girls that had been entirely developed under Mattel's leadership. Julie Albright arrives in 2000 seven. Julie is from 1975, and this is the first time the upper bounds of the AG historical timeline is being pushed forward. Molly was the most recent girl when the brand was launched, and she stayed the most recent until 2007 with Julie. Julie launched during the period when best friends were still a thing, so they launched her with a doll and a book already made for her best friend, Ivy Ling. Ivy went away with the rest of the best friends once that line was no longer a thing, and she remains the only doll in the collection of Asian descent that they have ever had. In 2009, we get Rebecca Rubin from 1914, and then in 2011, we get Cecile Ray and Marie Grace Gardner from 1953 New Orleans. Cecile and Marie Grace share the era equally. Neither of them is considered a best friend. They're just both a main girl of that era, uh, but they were retired about the same time as the best friends went away. They were only around for a hot second. Their retirement was announced about three years after the launch. In 2012, Caroline Abbott from 1812 is added. Caroline, Rebecca, and Julie are all still around when Be Forever hits, so they are included in the rebranding along with the older girls, but Caroline doesn't last very long after that. She is discontinued in 2015, so again, she was only around for just a few years. And then during the Be Forever era, three new girls were created and introduced directly into the Be Forever line. We get 1954 Mary Ellen Larkin, and then 1963 Melody Ellison, and then 1940. 43, Ninea Mitchell. American Girl scraps Be Forever in 2019, which it took them long enough. Like, the best time to stop Be Forever was immediately, and the second best time was in 2019, when apparently they came to their senses and realized it sucked. The Be Forever branding went away, but unfortunately, a lot of the changes they made to the dolls and to their world remained, including the horrendous meat outfits for most of them. But a lot of the doll stuff that was released during that time is retired in 2019, and Felicity, the doll and her whole collection, is retired as well. The books do get their illustrations back, but they also also receive even more cuts, uh, and they've been changed so much that they are now considered abridged. After Be Forever, what a phrase. After Be Forever, the girls are branded just as the historical characters, and AG starts adding new girls again. In 2020, we get Courtney Moore from 1986, and in 2022, we get Claudia Wells from 1922. When Courtney launched, there was definitely a lot of hand-wringing about having a historical girl that's from the 80s, but that was mostly because it just made people who were kids in the 80s feel old. Remember, when the American Girls launched in 1986, they had Molly, who was from 1944. That's a 42 year difference, which is a little bit bigger than the 34 year difference between 2020 and 1986, but not by that much. It is really weird that the historical timeline of American Girl caught up with the history of American Girl, the brand, which means that theoretically Courtney could have owned an American Girl doll, which she did, and you can buy a tiny Molly doll for your Courtney doll. How can you be mad at that? That's so great. So I'm not going to be mad about that 34 year gap, but that is very different from the 24-year gap between today and the most recent release. In 2023, we got another set of two that are sharing the era, and this time they are twins, very Mary-Kate and Ashley inspired, from 1999. 19...
99. If you're doing the math, and you should be, get some graph paper or something if you need to, you'll see that American Girl has created 18 historical girls. It's technically 20, but I'm counting the sets as a single girl, I suppose. So 18 of those 10 girls can still be purchased today from American Girl as two or more books and a doll with a doll collection. Actually, that's a lie. That number is 11 as of this year because Kit was re-released with her original non-ugly meat outfit to celebrate the 100th birthday of the character. Not of the character's creation, but the 100th birthday of what her canonical birthday of the character is. You know what I mean. A handful of her classic outfits and accessories were released as well, so that counts as a full collection. But I do kind of expect her to be put away and re-retired again in a year or two, along with any other girls who are lying around that aren't doing the right numbers. Because retirement and reissuing are just part of the American Girl business model now. Some of these girls were only ever around for a few years, and individual items are constantly being pulled from the website. And there are more and more outfits and items and entire dolls that are designed to be limited edition from the beginning. This is probably good for sales, right? Doll collectors who buy tons of these dolls are going to make sure to get the girl of the year or an exclusive collaboration before it gets yanked off of the website. But this impermanence, which has spread throughout the brand, totally disrupts the way that kids and families used to engage with American Girl. I should mention that these dolls are friggin' expensive. Actually, I know I've mentioned that before, but I, I need to give you some numbers. In 1986, a Samantha Parkington doll with a paperback copy of Meet Samantha and her meat accessories would be $68, which in today's money is $190.49. I typed that into the Bureau of Labor Statistics online calculator, hit enter, and then threw up a little. Okay, that's only about $160 in pre-COVID money in January 2020 money, which makes me feel better about American Girl dolls and so much worse about my future. Now today, you can buy this girl, whoever she is, with her terrible ugly accessories and a paperback of the Frankenstein book Samantha colon The Gift for $141. So it does look like she's gone way up in price, but she's actually gone down a little bit against inflation. In 2021, she got a reissue in her original outfit and accessories with a paperback of Meet Samantha. I'll talk about that more in a minute. But even that was available for about $150. In the 80s, 90s, 2000s, most of the doll outfits and accessory sets were about $20. The bigger and fancier items might be $40 or $50. Furniture would be a little more than that, and then there were a handful of big ticket items that could be over $100, like the big trunks that could fit your doll and her wardrobe, or the bedroom furniture for the girls, or crazy stuff like Felicity had a carriage that could fit two 18-inch dolls in it. I want that carriage so badly, it's unreal. So that's a lot of money for doll stuff, right? $20 in the year 2000, say, which is about $30 pre-COVID and $36 now, which roughly matches actually the price of the clothes and accessories for the historical girls now. $20 or $30 or $36, whatever it is, for a dress for a doll? For, for a doll. For one dress. This is a lot of money. And I don't want to minimize the fact that that price point simply put American Girl dolls and doll stuff out of reach for a lot of American families. Like for plenty of people, that was just a non-starter. And that was unfortunately part of the mystique a lot of the time, like the exclusivity that these weren't dolls for pores. That was always in the branding somewhere. So not to minimize that. And there used to be this thing, the middle class, and it was really cool. If we pick that same year, the year 2000, when an American Girl doll was, I think a little less than $100 new, uh, the newest gaming console would have been the PlayStation 2, which would start at $299 before you got any games. Even if you got an older console, that's still gonna be $150 or $200 to get the system and a couple games. That certainly would be considered a big ticket present to get your kid, right? Unfortunately, it's just not accessible to families that are financially struggling, but it was accessible for many families as a planned special gift for something like a birthday or the holidays. It was expensive, but it was seen as something really special and something that would give the kid literally hundreds of hours of enjoyment. American Girl dolls used to be thought of the same way, or they could be treated that way. They were expensive, for sure, 
but they were luxury items. If you have never held one of these dolls, I promise you, you can just feel how well made they are. They are high quality and lovely without being too delicate, so a kid will see them as special, but will also be able to play with them a ton. The doll collections were priced at a luxury price point, but produced like luxury items. They had a level of almost unnecessary detail and historical accuracy and functional abilities that made them just delightful to handle and rewarding to spend a lot of time with. So yeah, not to minimize the insanity that is $150 dolls for children, but they did live up to that price tag. And it wasn't expected that you had every piece of a doll's collection. You would pour over the catalog and bathe in the beauty of the existence of the girl's whole world, but a typical doll owner would only own a couple carefully chosen outfits and items. I'm sure there are children of gazillionaires who had an American Girl doll room with everything for every doll, but that wasn't what the company was pushing. Obviously, American American Girl wants to sell you as much as possible, that's how the business works, and there have been strategies like the Best Friends line, for instance, that have encouraged people to get a second doll or get even more outfits. But most of American Girl's marketing is about one girl having one doll. The catalog pictures don't show a girl assembling an army of American Girl dolls, it shows her doting on her one doll, and then maybe going to hang out with her friends who each have their one doll. The norm was to have one girl that was your girl and just love her to death. To cultivate a long-term relationship with one or maybe a couple girls through their stories and collections and movies and extended girl-focused universe. And you had that experience even if you didn't own everything. Even if you yourself didn't own every piece of a doll's collection, and again, you almost certainly didn't, it still mattered that they existed. I mean, browsing the catalog was a pastime in itself. Even if you didn't own the doll version of a particular dress, it mattered that it existed out there, which meant you would get to interact with it in other ways. It matters that there's a book where you can read about, say, her nighttime routine, and hey, it's kind of the same as yours because you also brush your hair and put on your pajamas, but also it's kind of different because she has a wash basin instead of a sink, and what would it be like to have a house without internal plumbing? And that wash basin, the thing that you'd never heard of before and is really lovely but also kind of gross in the same way, it exists. It exists in the book, in the story and in the illustration, and it exists in the doll's collection, and it exists in other media surrounding her world that tell true stories and give details on what life was really like, and maybe it's part of the paper dolls, or maybe there's a reference to it in a craft book. And that means it's real. Every part of her world is real and complete. This is not some random doll that we put in a nice old-timey outfit with no rhyme or reason. This is an American girl. This is Samantha, or this is Kaya. This is a particular girl who lives in a complete world with internal logic that is just as vivid and complex and interesting as your own. You are pulled in by that level of detail and by the verisimilitude of it, which makes it relatable even when you're learning about something that's so unfamiliar to you. These dolls weren't made to be toys that were played with for three weeks after Christmas and then forgotten about. They were made to be treasured. They were produced to be heirloom quality and to be timeless feeling and give people daydreams about passing down their dolls to their kids, which plenty of people did. But even if they weren't able to hand down their physical doll, they could still hand down that experience. If you were a girl in the 80s and you loved your Kirsten doll, but you didn't have her anymore by the time you had a 10-year-old of your own in the 2000s, you could still open up the American Girl catalog or website and get a Kirsten doll that looked the exact same as the one you had when you were a child and get it for your kid. Your kid might come home from the library toting a historical fiction series that they found that the librarian recommended, and oh my gosh, look at that, it's the exact same Samantha stories that you remember from when you were a kid. Once these dolls had stuck around for about 20 years, they became an institution that had the capacity for or this multi-generational connection that was really unique. A girl in the 80s might have a Molly doll and bond with her grandmother over it because Molly's girlhood is just like grandma's girlhood. And then that child grows up and passes her Molly doll on to her kid. And hey, she can even buy a few more of Molly's outfits to give as a gift. And then maybe also pick up a Claudie or a Mary Ellen because they have the same stuff that the kid's grandparents had. It builds, it snowballs. Because once it's special to you, you wanna share it. You wanna share it across generations and share it with your friends. Even within generations, these girls became shared 
shared vocabulary for kids, even for the ones that didn't have dolls, because they could still interact with the brand in other ways, like the books and the paper dolls. As long as you know the girls and you know not their appearance, but their personality, you can communicate that, hey, I'm a Molly or I'm an Addie. And you know what? I think you're a Felicity. Imagine having that as a company and deciding, eh, not really interested. Not really our thing. We don't want to have a reputation for stability and longevity, for being characters that a girl can have a long-term relationship with throughout her childhood through books and dolls and then pass to her kids and bond with her grandparents about. That doesn't sound like fun. We don't have that anymore. When you remember that that's what American Girl used to be, what it has the capacity to be, it sounds kind of silly when people try to tell you that the historical line is still around because like they did a round of re-releases for the 35th anniversary and for just a couple months you could get Felicity in her old non-ugly outfit and a paperback that had the old cover. No, you can't get anything else from her wardrobe and no, she's not going to be in the catalog and you can't get the rest of her books or the craft kits or the cookbooks and or the matching outfits for the girls. No. No, she won't be around anymore as soon as she's sold out. No, she isn't a girl with a whole world to explore that will be there for you when you need her. So how is she back at all? She's not back. They didn't bring them back. They're lying to you. What is a little kid supposed to do with this? American Girl gives you nothing. You can't change her clothes, not unless you're getting them from the secondary market. You can maybe figure out how to make your own, but that's not encouraged by American Girl anymore. They actually used to sell sewing patterns for the original historical girls, but not for a long time. You can just look at her in her one outfit. An outfit you're not even really experiencing because you're not handling it. You're not taking the various layers on and off and feeling it and understanding how it works. Now, changing clothes is not the only way to play with a doll, right? You can also engage in imaginative play inspired by the relationships and the conflicts in her story which American Girl seems to not really want you to even read. The stories have been cut and condensed and abridged and the illustrations taken in and out and the covers messed with, and overall the books are just kind of sidelined by the brand. There's no connection between the doll and the books except for the passages that have been rewritten to reference her new Be Forever outfit. I can't read about her birthday meal and then open the catalog pages and see the chairs and the little dishes from that meal and then cook a recipe from the meal out of her cookbook. American Girl isn't giving me instructions to plan a party with my friends who also know this girl and will have some context for the historically inspired crafts we're gonna do and games we're gonna play. And there is almost zero engagement by the brand with the actual history behind the doll, with placing her in a broader context of real people and events and offering the fact behind the fiction. So what is the point of this? So what even is American Girl right now? Today, American Girl is primarily focused on the non historical parts of the brand, and that's super bad, but not for the reasons usually given. The issue is not that these girls are contemporary or even that they're new. It's because they're temporary. AJ is mainly focused on transient products right now. The girl of the year, their exclusive temporary collaborations with other brands, the customizable dolls that you can mix and match to look just like you. They are still at a luxury price point, although they are not really luxury quality anymore. I say in a very limited, uneducated experience right now not as a doll collector, but as somebody who just went to an American Girl store recently. Look, they're very nice, okay? They're still nice, but they're not $40 for an outfit nice. But that's not where the value is coming from. The value isn't coming from the quality or the expertise needed to make a historical reproduction item for a doll. The value is coming from the exclusivity. It comes from the prestige of the brand name, it, prestige established by the production of better stuff in the past, combined with the pressure of knowing that these things are just for now. If you want to collect, you'd better do it today because these girls won't be around long enough to form any kind of long-term relationship. On the website and in the stores, there's very little attention given to any of the girls that were created after 2015. Rather than slowly adding new girls one by one to a lineup that will collectively get older and richer every year, the company just churns through new characters, constantly adding constantly taking them out. There's no ability for families to develop a long-term relationship with these girls because they just haven't been around very long, and they won't be around for very long. Any one of these girls could be announced for retirement
garment at any moment and be gone within the year. They are treated by the brand as for now items that are trading on novelty, not as a, a timeless institution. I think there is hope for this brand. As I mentioned, Kit was re-released for her birthday and it was a legitimate re-release, not the 35th anniversary nonsense. Molly was brought back for Be Forever, but wasn't given a total makeover for like Costco reasons. So you can still get a small handful of items for her that are solid. Kaya has maintained a strong collection as well. She never had as many outfits as the other girls because of her particular historical context, but many of her original items can still be purchased and they are very beautiful and well done. And Claudia Wells, one of the newest girls, is legitimately great. I see flashes of old school American girl glory in her. Her outfits are unspeakably adorable and they are well fitted to the doll. They are historically grounded. They fit the character. The accessories are detailed and beautiful and so thoughtfully done. She has a travel set that has these tiny replicas of actual vintage 1920s Madame C.J. Walker cosmetics. How cool is that? She seems to be hitting that level of specificity and care that makes American girls really come alive. But Claudie seems, at least at the moment to be more the exception than the rule. The 90s twins are following an overall trend of increasing recency, with collections trading primarily on retro nostalgia more than a deep engagement with a past time period. Now this timeline that I've been using has the girls in release order, but to really get a good idea of this you would need to see the girls in chronological order which I have. I got crafty and got an American Girl sticker book, which of course didn't have the discontinued ones, so I also had to print off some color pictures from the library. I hope this doesn't horribly throw off the colors on my recording. <laughs> yes, I think it is. I think it's doing bad things to the light, but we persevere. So this timeline has the girls chronologically in terms of their place in history. The yellow lines are for girls that have a collection that can be purchased from American Girl as of right now in September 2023. And no, a doll alone does not count as a collection. I feel like I've established that that's, that's not what an American Girl is. Some of these girls have like two outfits and barely a collection, but if they have anything to buy, I will count them. And if we look at our timeline, there's a very clear trend, right? You could almost exactly draw a line right here to separate the dolls that are and aren't still available. Kaya is still around, but other than her, retired doll is basically synonymous with older doll, like older chronologically, like pre-20th century doll. Those are literally the same as the retired ones. Most of them have been totally discontinued. You can't get anything from American Girl, but a few of them you can still get just the doll. She just doesn't have any kind of a collection. So that would be Addie and Josefina and Samantha. Kaya, all the way over here, okay, first one, is literally the only collection that is still available that is pre-20th century. There are no collections available right now that are between Kaya in 1764 and Rebecca in 1914. This is true to scale. I sat down with a tape measure to do this thing and get it as close as true to scale as possible. And you can visually see that it's almost half the board that has no available doll collections. This is not a historical toy line. It's just not. If you can count on your hands the number of outfits and accessory sets and furniture pieces and whatever that are inspired by any year prior to 1914, that's not a historical toy line. You just don't have a doll line inspired by American history if you have nothing between 1764 and 1914. Because a lot of it's in there, actually. A lot of the important bits, that's the majority of the board. Even if we say American history begins in 1764, even if we grant that, the American Girl historical line as it exists today is missing more than half. With what exists now, you potentially have a really nice 20th century inspired vintage retro brand, right? That's great, but we see the difference between that and American history, right? American Girl has basically abandoned the idea of being girls across American history. 
And for some reason, it really bothers me that they won't admit it. There is no true historical line anymore, but you wouldn't know that from looking at the website header or their promotional images or the way that a lot of people talk about the brand. They trot out these girls and they act like they're still around, like they're still alive, like you can still access the magic of the 2002 American Girl catalog when these girls lived and breathed and had whole worlds. And you can't! And I know, like 10 minutes ago, I said that this wasn't my main issue, you know? That the real issue is not that these girls happen to be set more recently in time, but that they are transient and shallow products that don't encourage a long-term relationship and deep engagement with a fictional historical girl, right? Not that they're from the 90s. But if I'm honest, that's a big part of what my issue is. And at the end of the day, am I any better than the hand-wringing Gen X op-ed writers from 2013 having a fit because a thing from my childhood is different now? And on some level, no. Like, look at this. You think that a person with a healthy relationship with nostalgia makes this? This is nostalgia that is fueling the creation of this video, right? I love these original girls. And when I went to the American Girl store on 6th Avenue on a recent trip to New York, those were the girls I wanted to see. And while I was happy to see the store had big rooms devoted to historical girls, it was all Julie and Courtney and the twins. And I don't know those girls. I don't know her and I don't care about her. Thing different now and that make me uncomfy. But I hope after talking for an hour, I have shown you that there is more than nostalgia at play. I did the math because this is my life now. And in 2003, when all of the Pleasant Company developed girls were out, the average chronological distance of the stories, like the difference between the year the girl is set and the then present of 2003, that age was on average 145 years. That was the average across eight girls with collections available. Today, with 11 girls, again, we're counting Nikki and Isabel, the twins, as one, the average historical age, the average distance from 2023 is 88 years. And if we consider Kaya an outlier who should not be counted and take her off of both lists, then the 2003 number is still 132 years. And today's number is 71 years. 71 years, that's within a lifetime. So I have numbers. These girls aren't just a little newer. They are on average half as old. And they're all trying to take up the same eras. They're all crammed into the last 80 years ago, except for our unproblematic Queen Kaya holding down the 18th century solo, single-handedly increasing the average age of the line by 17 years. Kaya, I love you. Please do not retire. This is like decades day at Spirit Week, and a lineup of girls from different decades is fundamentally a different project than a lineup of girls across American history. American Girl just means something different now. And I think these girls, these girls are great. Look, I don't know them that well, but these girls can still have a ton of value. It is really valuable to give kids a way to connect with the recent past, which sometimes adults will forget that they didn't experience or don't know anything about. And maybe their stories don't have life or death stakes. Okay, I don't care. Their lives can still be interesting. Their hopes and fears and feelings and experiences still matter even if they aren't fighting for survival. I haven't read the books of these new girls. Maybe they're good, maybe they're not. I know for sure they're shorter, but whether or not they're good, it won't be because the year of the setting. It's not that there's not value there. But even the dolls with the biggest collections right now, like your Courtney's and your Julie's, they still have a much smaller world than the classic girls used to. They have fewer outfits, yes, but it's not just that. They also have a much smaller literary canon with fewer books that span a shorter time frame and spend a lot less time giving historical context. They don't invite kids to experience their worlds through hand-on crafting and cooking. They don't really engender curiosity about the world that they live in because it's more or less the same world that the kid playing with them is living in. There are differences, of course, but there's just so much less challenge in relating to the recent past. We have good quality photos of these periods, and if kids watch news footage or movies or TV from these times, they're gonna see people that walk and talk basically like they do. Honestly, plenty of this stuff is in fashion now anyways. A kid is gonna look at the Twins 90s collection and find the same stuff they saw in the Target dorm section last week. But there 
are real barriers to relating to and understanding life of somebody that lived more than a century ago. It is hard for humans of any age to truly see people of the past as real people, living lives as complicated and vivid and real as our own. That's hard to do for anybody, including kids. An American girl could do it, or they used to at least try. These aren't American girls. These are just some dolls. These are zombies. Zombie versions of the girls that wanted to change the world, staggering around in their one terrible outfit with their abridged books and no context, no life, no complete world, trying to grab collector dollars, completely unable to have a relationship with the kids and the families that they were supposed to be for. And now I'm sad. Thank you so much for watching. I have embarked on a mission to explore the American girls in depth, one by one, in release order, and it has been nonstop Kirsten Larson content on TikTok for like a month for me. I am getting close to being done with my Kirsten analysis long form video, which is going to include recaps of all of her books, a look at every piece of her doll collection. I have also cooked a bunch of recipes from her cookbook and made things from her craft book and a lot of other fun stuff, so we're having a good time, but it's a lot of work and it's going to be very long. So the Kirsten video will be there as soon as I can manage, so hit all of the buttons if you want to be around to see that. And once I have fully wrapped up Kirsten, the next on deck will be Samantha. Hope to see you there. Bye!